Hey, all you cool cats and kittens, it's your favorite history teacher back at you again with another historical video. Today, we, um, well, we kind of keep our discussion going about depression <laughs> and the impacts it had on the American psyche, males, females, and even children. So let's share my screen real real debbie downer title today hardship and suffering hmm hardship and suffering yeah module nine lesson two remember there are only three lessons in this module chapter whatever you want to call it so fun times well, not fun times for these people. Mm -mm. That was your warm-up objectives. We're going to explore how competition for jobs impacted race relations during the Great Depression. I said that's why so many families moved from their homes during the Great Depression. Investigate how the Depression affected men, women, and children. Oh, I didn't have a slide title. Oh, that's very unlike me. Oh, yeah. There you go. The Ville. So statistics such as un the unemployment rate tell only part of the story of the Great Depression. Remember, 25%. One in every four men were out of jobs. The most important impact uh, that it had on people's lives, the Depression brought hardship, homelessness, and hunger to millions. In cities across the country, people lost their jobs, were evicted from their homes, and ended up in the streets. Some slept in parks or sewer pipes, wrapping themselves in newspapers to fend off the cold. Others built makeshift shafts, makeshift shacks out of scrap materials. Before long, numerous shanty towns, little towns consisting of shacks, sprang up. Hundreds of these settlements dotted the country. Many, uh, these were only uh, the only shelter available to hundreds of thousands of people who had lost their homes. And many Americans called these shanty towns test question Hoovervilles, since they blamed the president Hoover for the depression. Every day, the poor dug through garbage or bags. Soup kitchens offered free or low cost food, and bread lines received uh, food provided by charitable organizations or public agencies. So here are pictures of Hoovervilles. Little shacks, little sheds. Uh, here are soup kitchens and bread lines. All right, minorities. So conditions for the for African Americans and Latinos were especially difficult. Their unemployment rates were higher, and they were the lowest paid. They also had to de to deal with the increasing racial violence from the unemployed whites. Uh, for instance, in 1933, the hardest year of the Depression, 24 African Americans were lynched. Again, lynching is unsanctioned, uh, illegal executions. Latinos, Mexicans, and Mexican Americans in the Southwest were also targeted. Whites demanded that Latinos be deported, even though they had been born in America. By the, by the late 1930s, hundreds of thousands of people of Mexican descent actually relocated back to Mexico. Some went voluntarily, others were legally deported. Like, they just packed up their things and left because why, why live in a country where you're going to be constantly um, targeted for the way you look, the way you speak? All right, dust bunny. So... Life in the rural areas were hard, but they did have one advantage of over city life. And that is most farmers could grow their own food for their families. Now, with falling prices and rising debt, thousands of farmers will lose their land. Between 1929 and 1932, about 400,000 farms were lost through foreclosures. Many farmers turned to tenant farming and barely scraped out a living. Tenant farming is basically like you pay someone for a percentage of their crop yield for that season they take a they take a cut and you get the rest 
The drought that began in the early 1930s will wreak havoc on the Great Plains. It was a disaster that developed over time. Several years of good rain and mild winter lulled farmers into thinking that their land was suitable for intensive agriculture, and that is growing constantly wheat and corn, all that. During the 20s, farmers from Texas to the Dakotas had used the newly affordable tractors to break up the grasslands and plant millions of acres of new farmland. Deep plowing had removed the thick protective layer of prairie crops. Farmers had then exhausted the land through overproduction, and the grasslands became unsuitable for farming. So when the rain stopped and the winds began to blow in the 30s, look, the little grass and few trees that were left to hold down the soil, that was all. Winds will scatter the topsoil, exposing sand and the grit underneath. Um, and also, you know, tornadoes. Not saying that tornadoes cause all this, but you know, wind, wind is a uh, it, it hurts. So the region that was hit hardest included parts of Kansas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Colorado, Texas, and this was known as the Dust Bowl. The Dust Bowl. Test question: Dust Bowl. Plagued by the dust storms and evictions, farmers had to decide whether to continue cultivating unproductive land or give up and move on. Thousands of farmers and sharecroppers decided just to leave their land behind. They packed up their families and few belongings and headed out west along Route 66 to California, IA, where they could find jobs. Some of these migrants were called Okies uh, and will find work as a farmhand. Others began to wander in search of work. So here you got a big old dust storm. These people look happy. Happy that they're leaving town. All right, blood is thicker than water. So in the face of suffering, what the Great Depression caused, the family stood as a source of strength for most Americans. Although some people feared that hard times would undermine moral values like the 20s did, those concerns were largely unfounded. In general, Americans believed in traditional values and emphasized the importance of family unity. At a time when money was tight, Families entertained themselves by staying at home or playing board games such as Monopoly. <laughs> Invented in 1933 or listening to the radio. Because, like I said, everyone had a radio. Nevertheless, the economic difficulties of the Great Depression put a severe pressure on family life. Trying to make ends meet date was a daily struggle. In some cases, families broke apart underneath the strain. You got kids playing Monopoly. All right, man's harsh reality. Oh, mm, boy. Failed industries meant unemployment for countless men. Many of them had difficulty coping with the unemployment because they were accustomed to working and supporting their families because, you know, it's a man's world. Every day, they would set out to walk the streets in search of jobs. Some men would become so discouraged that they just stopped trying because, you know, you could do it month a month two, three, but when it becomes years of not being able to find a job and always being told no, well, then you stop trying. But maybe that's why they had the 21st Amendment repealed so people can start drinking again. Having left families behind, some men will hit the road. As many as 3,000, 3,000, 300,000, 300K, 300,000, transients or hobos who wander the country riding uh hitching rides on rr is railroads box cars and sleeping under bridges over time these hobos developed a hidden language to help them survive they would mark houses or fences near railroad yards with symbols that revealed where they could get food water or a place to sleep some hobos would occasionally turn up at homeless shelters in big cities during the years of the Great Depression, there was no federal system of direct relief, a.k.a. cash payments or food the government provides for the poor. So what you think now definitely was not around back then. Um, there were no, if you call it, government handouts. There were no COVID cash relief or Great Depression cash relief. 
because the country just wasn't prepared for that, A, and B, uh, didn't even think about that. So some cities and charity surf- services did offer help to those who needed it, but the benefits were meager. I think I saw your book says it was like $2.38 a day, uh, but that's clearly not enough for a family makes you survive. Maybe an individual man, but not not a whole entire seven person family. Um, ironically enough, you know it's a man's world. Um, you you kind of think karma, right? Not letting women work and always having to have this macho sense of I have to provide for my family. And one out of every four men lost a job. So here's some hobos, people walking. All right. So women targets. Uh, women worked hard to help their family survive the adversity during the Great Depression. Obviously, they had to they had to hold it together. And especially if their their husband left them, like go go ladies. Uh, many women canned food or sewed clothes. They also carefully managed the household budgets. So you could probably tell who, which, uh, person of the, the man or the wife, husband or wife was, you know, financially responsible, AKA not going out to the, um, speakeasies. Many women also worked outside the home, though they usually received less money than men did. And as the depression wore on, working women became the targets of enormous resentment. Many people believe that women, especially married women, had no right to work where there were men who were unemployed. Isn't that a bit ironic that you don't want women to work, and now that there are women working, you who uh, you being the man who wants to who wants to work, it can't because this woman is working there instead of you. Even though it could have been like a secre- secretarial job, um, a monotonous job, uh, even a teacher or a nurse, right? Oh, but it's got a man's got to work first. All this backwards thinking makes you think how um, how did they even survive, right? In the early 30s, some cities will even refuse to hire married women as school teachers. Many Americans assumed that women were having it easier than men during the Great Depression because there were few very seen begging or standing in bread lines. So people were assuming that women were having it easier. So therefore, they want to take their job away so so that they can equally suffer during this time. Just think about that. I don't know when watches these, but, you know, just think about that. As a matter of fact, many women were starving to death in cold attics or rooming houses, and they were just too ashamed to reveal their hardship. Also, probably they were told by their husband, stay inside and take care of the kids while I go wait in a bread line. Seems about right. I hear women working. Um, thousands of single women need jobs. Thousands of married women or ERA, Equal Rights Amendment. Fire married women, hire needy single women. Like, you have women hating on women. If married, we would we get jobs? I don't know. There's a light in this way. We can't. If married, would we get jobs? Question, oh, question mark. All right, children suffer. So children also suffer during the 30s. Poor diets and lack of money for health care led to serious health problems. Milk consumption declined across the country, 
And clinics and hospitals reported a dramatic rise in malnutrition and diet-related diseases such as rickets. Now, I looked up what rickets means, and rickets is the weakening of your bones. Uh, vitamin D deficiency. At the same time, child welfare programs were slashed as cities and states cut their budgets in the face of the dwindling resources. Falling tax revenues also caused school boards to shorten the school year or even close schools. And by 1933, some 2,600 schools across the nation had shut down, leaving more than 300,000 students out of school. It's like 2020 all over again. Thousands of children went to work instead, labored in crowded sweatshops under horrendous working conditions. Because if you're not going to go to school, you need to work, even if it is for less than a dollar a day. So what child labor and employer think about? Oh, lost childhood, oh, playing outside. And the greedy employer, the employer of child labor, financial gains, new car, money, money, money. All right, wild boys. So many teenagers will look for a way out of the suffering or to ease the pressure on their family. So you have an example of a guy named Eugene Williams. He was one of those desperate teenagers, 13. He said, if I leave my mother, it will mean one less mouth to feed. Well, that's dark and gloomy. Eugene may have been one of the hundreds of thousands of teenage boys and some girls who hoped who hopped aboard America's freight trains to zigzag the country in search of work and adventure and escape from poverty. These, quote, wild boys came from every section of the U.S., from every corner of society. They were sons of poor farmers, out-of-work miners, and wealthy parents who lost everything. They were nicknamed Hoover tourists who were eager to tour America but to free. And then you have another example. Uh, your book goes on to talk about um, a guy named George Phillips. Uh, from his early years of adolescence, 11 to 17, he rode the rails catching local freights out of his hometown of Princeton, Missouri. While exciting, the road could also be deadly. Many riders were beaten or jailed by bulls or armed freight yard patrolmen. Often, riders had to sleep standing up in constant deafening rumble. So, riding the rails, right, is what it's called. And, you know, trains, right, charge companies to haul freight across the country. They don't charge people. Or, I mean, some trains that are passenger trains charge people. These guys are just hopping along and looking to get a ride somewhere. Uh, out of town, faux free. Some would be accidentally locked in ice cars for days on end. Others fell prey to murderous criminals. I mean, this is perfect time to kill, right? Um, so in the 10-year span from 1929 to 1939, 24,000 riders were killed. 27,000 were injured on railroad property. Now, that's, that's a lot of people dead. Uh, <laughs> when you think, I think of Wild Boys, I think of Chris Pontius and Steve O on MTV. Um, and yeah, uh, here you, this is a movie. Uh, that's why it looks like obviously it's staged, but when you look at look up on um, Google, uh, Wild Boys riding trains, Great Depression. There's this movie, and that's all the pictures that were shown. All right. Uh, mental game. So the hardships of the Great Depression had a tremendous social and psychological impact. Some people were so demoralized by hard times that they lost their will to survive. In 19, between 1928 and 1932, the suicide rates rose than more than 30%. And three times as many of those people were admitted to state hospitals as in normal times. Economic problems forced many Americans to accept compromises and make sacrifices that affected them for the rest of their lives. Adults stopped going to the doctor or dentist because they couldn't afford it. Young people gave up their dreams of going to college. Others put off getting married, raising large families, or having children at all. Because why raise a child during the Depression? For many people, the stigma of poverty and having to scrimp 
and save never disappeared completely. For some, achieving financial security became the primary focus in life. During the Great Depression, many people showed great kindness to strangers who were down on their luck. People often gave food, clothing, and a place to stay to the needy. Families helped other families and shared resources and strengthened the bonds within their communities. In addition, many people developed the habits of saving and thrift times, habits they would need to see themselves through the dark days ahead as the nation and President Hoover struggled with the GD, Great Depression. And yeah, that's going to conclude that uh, lecture. Hopefully it's not all doom and gloom for you. Um, makes you think, what happened? So, I mean, if you got grandparents or great-grandparents that lived during this time period, ask them how they survived. Um, or if they have great-great, or if you have a great-great-great-grandparent that your grandparents remember about, ask them. Ask them how they survived. Um, I know both my grandparents, um, well, both sets aren't, aren't living anymore, but um, they were born before, obviously, the Great Depression. Never really got the chance to ask them later in life. But, you know, a family of seven living in Oakland, got to be tough. Got to be tough. All right. Enough about me. Um, your homework is page 428, three through five. Uh, and, yeah, hopefully you guys did enjoy. If you did, make sure you hit that like button, leave a comment, subscribe. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.